Thank you, you're too kind. I usually can play for about an hour, then I feel like a spare tire blowing out. <coughs> <coughs> it's nice to be here in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, my name is Josh, I'm from Western Australia, and it gives me the pleasure to be able to come here and share some of our ideas and experiences that we're currently doing back home and to bring them here and to share them with you. I guess uh, my story begins <coughs> in a small coastal town <coughs> called Busselton. And uh, my father was one of the pioneering families and my mother is a traditional Wadandi Nyungar woman, Aboriginal woman from the area. Two very different worlds. My mother, she grew up in the bush with my grandparents. They were one of the last Aboriginal people to come out of the bush. They were getting their water from the well. There was no electricity. They were hunting all their traditional foods. And they would do so with the seasons. My father obviously met my mother. They hit it off, as you do. And here I am. <coughs> so, I guess growing up as a child, I never really realised how fortunate and how lucky life was. You know, we were really spoilt. We were eating kangaroo, we were eating emu, blue bone groper, abalone off the rocks, fresh crab with the seasonal change, wallabies and so on. And so it was a very interesting life growing up. Where I live in our family, in our Aboriginal family on my mother's side, there's about 600 people. And out of those 600 people, about 250 of those still practice the traditional ways, the language, the culture, the customs and the beliefs. When I was 17, I left my little coastal town and went straight up to, into the Kimberleys to a place called Kununurra, one of the hottest places in Australia. It was hot. Some days I had the thermometer in there. When I was working, it was up to 50 degrees. Most days were 40. I guess when I got up into those areas, I realised it was, it was such a culture shock to go around because I could see some of the community still dealing with those issues of dispossession and assimilation and so that made me realise and think and once my grandfather passed away, rest in peace, my sister got married, my mother was sick, it was time to come home. <coughs> when I come back home, we opened a family cultural centre at Injun Up, 40 acres on the coast, walking distance to the beach, beautiful and uh, the day before we opened the doors to the new centre, our grandfather, you know, he had already passed and it was important that we wanted to continue and carry his legacies on. And so we began doing cultural activities on country, sharing knowledge, experiences, foraging for foods with the six seasonal change, and really a wonderful lifestyle to pass down and continue on through the families. As I worked there for a few years, I decided there was a need for more, and it was burning inside of me that there was a a passion burning. I needed to create something for our visitors to the area to really get a better perspective and awareness on Abri Aboriginal culture to the southwest of Western Australia. Our mother's family, we are Wadandi people, so Wadandi means forest people by the sea, salt water people. So I left the cultural centre, trained up a few staff and created Kumu Dreaming. Now Kumu is my Aboriginal name, given to me by the elders. And uh, dreaming is a part of our dreaming and our spirituality. Um, a little bit about Kumu Dreaming. We run Aboriginal cultural experiences on country. We forage for all our ingredients, we catch all our own food. We have a farm property where we run cattle. But in saying that, kangaroos and emus and wallabies all come onto there, so they become on the dinner table as well. Education, leadership programs. We were working in education as well, lecturing, doing a bit of horticulture. We wanted to um, give something back to a lot of the Aboriginal kids that weren't so fortunate to grow up um, 
being surrounded by influential Aboriginal people such as myself and that connection to country and identity and sense of belonging. So that's why we run Aboriginal leadership programs as well and provide opportunities for local Aboriginal people. Cultural awareness is a big thing. When visitors come into Australia and into the southwest area, it's really important for them to get a really clear perspective of what we're about, who we are, and the different experiences that connect people to that Pacific area, connects them to country, and then to have a true experience of Australian culture. At Welcome to Countries, we, at all events, just like this, uh, we do Welcome to Countries, usually done by an elder or cultural custodian. Traditional music, song, dance. So some of the music that I play there is usually a welcome song. We have a dance group called the Wadandi Dreaming Dancers and uh, we do a lot of the local events and festivals in the area. Arts and crafts. My mother's a, quite a distinguished artist. I'm also an artist. I love to paint and uh, I love to share the stories and the the stories in the paintings connect people back to the area, to the land, to the animals. Community engagement, where we're constantly working with community, building relationships and partnerships because it enhances what we're currently doing. And in a lot of areas down south, to establish good business, we need to be able to build those relationships with local government, businesses and, uh, and so on. Bush, bush foods, plants and medicines. As you walked in, you would have seen something on your chair. Now, in the small container, one of those there is uh, what we call borna. It's a bush onion, bush chilli. It's not as hot or spicy as as strong as we would usually make it. In the tea, it's got uh, peppermint leaves, which are called, the peppy tree we call wanang. <coughs> and now wanang is a, a peppermint tree, but it's more than a peppermint tree because we use the leaves, we use the bark, we use the roots, they're very flexible. We use them for building shelters and mimas. We do survival camps with universities. We show them how to live off the land with nothing. Lighting a fire with your fire stick, building your own shelters, collecting your food, the traditional ways. So what that is, it's a, a borana and it grows in the southwest, doesn't grow anywhere else in the world. It contains natural chemical and it, uh, we believe that it's a, a blood purifier. It's good for your liver. It's good for, it's very high in antioxidants. Some people take it because it's good for abnormal cell growth and it also has anti-tumoral properties. It's a strong medicine and it's really important that we respect that medicine as well because it is a food source. The old fellas used to roll it around the ashes of the fire, and tell the stories and eat it. And our family, it's quite a strong family and that's one of the medicines that we take I guess weekly, fortnightly and some must be doing something because we never get sick. <coughs> the other one in the container is what we call kula and that's uh, emu plum. Now it only flowers around March and we call it the kula, the emu plum is because when the emu is nesting it gets in the middle of this huge big bush, stomps down the middle of it lays down and lays the eggs in the middle of this emu plum bush. So you can imagine an emu sticking out of this long spiky grass with his head. So when they lay the eggs, they would actually, the female emu would take off and leave the male emu to sit on the eggs. And he would sit on those eggs and keep them warm until they hatched. And when he needed to feed, he would tiptoe 50 metres away from the nest, go off and feed and tiptoe back in so he wouldn't let other animals see his tracks to the nest. When they hatch, you get these beautiful little emu baby emus, which we call leech. And uh, <coughs> he would show them where all the water holes are, where all the sacred places. And as they got bigger throughout the season, the old man emu, the old male emu, he'd just lay on the ground and pretend to die. Just lay there. And uh, when you spend enough time in the bush and you look at the behaviour of these animals, you know, as a food source, but also as the behaviour and their pattern, that uh, it's quite unique. The emus would try to wake up the old male emu Eventually they, they take off back to the food sources, back to the water holes and become self-sufficient. He just wakes up, heads off in the other direction, meets up with the female emu and continues on his path and does the same thing in the following year. <coughs> so that's a little story about the emu, the weich. 
it's a beautiful bird and it has many different uses and I'll share a story uh, a little bit later about that Pacific bird. Kumul Dreaming Cultural Experiences, we have a range of different meeting places on country, upon the river, it's all very hands-on, interactive. Some of our experiences, such as food experiences, we take people overnight on location, forage all our ingredients, we're using things like kangaroo, wallaby, marsupial animal, fish, crabs, crustaceans, octopus, squid, birds, ducks, geese, emus, flocked animals and lots of different types of bush fruits and vegetables uh, that are seasonal. So depending on the season is depending on the foods that we're gathering from those areas. Here we have an example of teaching traditional fire lighting on one of our meeting places. We also make traditional hunting tools, very similar to the same type of hunting tools that were made by our ancestors. We haven't changed anything about it. When we do light the fire, we use the marmiti. So if we say belga marmiti kala, it's a fire stick from the grass tree to light the fire. And so the language that we speak is a traditional language which is only ever spoken throughout our area for, for 50,000 years. We have lots of caves in our region, so roughly about 300 caves between the Cape to Cape region. Um, from Cape Naturalist or Kerry Jenning up all the way down to Cape Lewin is a limestone granite ridge. And these caves are up to 500,000 to 800,000 years old. And they all run into the ocean. The significance of the caves is their pathways to the dreaming. So when the old fellas pass away, we take their spirit, their body down to these areas, their spirit travels through the caves, through the grottos, out to the horizon of the ocean and back to their dreaming. So they're considered sacred to the local people. We have a range of different foraging locations and trails where we select all our ingredients. Like I said, they are seasonal. Um, right here you can see um, the tea that you drank with the peppermint leaf, with a peppermint tree in front of us there. And uh, it's a unique plant, wonderful flavour. The peppermint leaves were actually used for traditional breath freshener. So a small piece of charcoal, clean your teeth, wash your mouth out with fresh water, chew on those leaves, and that was a way of brushing your teeth. Where is Wadandi country? <coughs> so the southwest area of Western Australia, right down the bottom, we've got the Southern Ocean, we've got the Indian Ocean, and where they meet is the beginning. So we've got beautiful rainforests, bushland, beautiful coastal areas, very untouched, very pristine, lots of animals, lots of food sources. So we still have that opportunity to live the lifestyle, the contemporary traditional lifestyle, being able to gather our foods, our medicines, and to be able to live off the land. The two oceans are very different from each other. You've got the Southern Ocean, the Indian Ocean. And we catch different uh, species of shellfish, fish in itself. Um, we don't really touch the fish when they're spawning, or when they're carrying the young or it's mating season. Aboriginal people were some of the first foragers, environmental farmers, using sustainable techniques to be able to live and survive off the land by farming the native plants and animals that were already there. They would burn the bush in autumn, circle burning techniques, would fertilise the soil, disperse seeds from native plants and create regrowth. A lot of bush plants and fruits and flowers will not refruit or flower if they're not burnt certain times of the year. So fire is really important. It's more than just a a tool to cook your food. It represents life, family and kinship. The six seasonal change. <coughs> Every two months in our area the season changes and this is pretty much what dictates the foods that we collect and this is how Aboriginal people survived in our area for 50,000 years. They saw, they saw changes upon the land that no one else has ever seen before. Our six seasons are Burak, Bunaru, Jilba, Cambrang, Makaroo and Duran. And every, every two months they change due to the changing of the plants, the animals and of course the weather. So the food sources that we're collecting are really important that we collect them within the right seasons because Aboriginal people never wanted to jeopardise the following season's food supplies. So it was really important that we abided by these, these laws and, and seasonal changes because it was important for our survival. Foraging for food. Now, it's no, it's no surprise that Australian bush foods are plentiful. Um, at certain times of the season, it's really important that we gather the foods that, uh, that come from the land, but also do it in a sustainable way. 
So by harvesting the fruits, the vegetables, you know, in this picture here, you can see the emu plum, which is the one you just tasted down the bottom right-hand side, the purple one. Now, we also call it the emu plum is because when the emu comes along, it will actually swallow the whole fruit and the seed. They walk 150, 200 metres, goes through the body, fertilise back into the ground, germinates, sprouts and grows another bush. And also to get those refruiting year round, you have to use different elements by trimming, cutting, smoking or burning. In the centre we have a bardi grub or a widgety grub and they usually love to bury themselves in amongst the wattle trees, golden wattle, sandalwood near the kwandong trees or the bell, the, the grass tree. Now some of the plants that we use are actually poisonous plants and Aboriginal people had the techniques of being able to filter these plants. There were some records of some of the first settlers coming over and they saw these big fruits, the zambia fruits, the dirigi, the zycads from the prehistoric times, so they've been around since dinosaurs. <coughs> so as Aboriginal people would gather these foods, they would have them in the camp and the settlers, they came, they saw the emu eating this fruit and they also saw the Aboriginal people harvesting these foods. But what they didn't know is Aboriginal people were filtering them in the river, drying them out in the sun, burning them in the fire, and then grinding them up to make flour to make traditional bread. This is what we call bayo nut. Wattle seed, woolly grass seed, bayo nut ground up together, sea salt, water, we make traditional bread in the ashes of the fire, burning she oak or peppermint or wanang. We also use the belga tree, which we collect the fire stick, which we call a marmiti. This is the big flower that comes from the top of the grass tree. And as we hollow it out <coughs> and cut it back, this is how we create fire. And it gives you appreciation for those simple things. Throughout Australia, the fire lighting is very different. But on our experiences on country, it's important that we light the fire with the traditional fire stick. We harvest the foods from the area in season. And that creates the whole experience, which is usually an overnight experience as camping on country in isolated areas, exclusive access. Bush cherries, wattle seeds, bush tomatoes, sea fig, salt bush, sea celery, uh, just to name a few. These are all different uh, elements that enhance our product and our foods. And uh, like I said, we really do want to be able to look after these plants that we're foraging for. So what we did is we looked at different ways we could make it more sustainable. Catching local produce. Like I said, we catch our traditional food in season. So food always tastes better in season. You've got some freshwater mussel, you've got some abalone, different abalone to the Southern Ocean and the Indian Ocean. This time of year now, back home, beautiful big bay of Underlup is full of crab, but we'll leave them alone next month because they'll start to have eggs. The different uh, fish that we use, some of them are migrating fish, some of them are very territorial. This is an uh, interesting one because still in Australia, <coughs> there's still a, a lot of families they can't bring themselves to eat the kangaroo and the emu, our coat of arms, our national emblem. As, as a child, I grew up eating kangaroo and emu, so I don't see any, any difference. To me, it's just as cute and cuddly as a piglet or a lamb. Uh, and surprisingly enough as well, because in the early days, when Australia was settled, colonised about 223 years ago, in the Swan River Valley towards Perth, Kangaroo stew was one of their main food, main food sources, so it's not a surprise that, uh, I mean, it is a surprise that, uh, that we're not utilising it as much as we should. It's very low in fat, it's very lean, very good for you, and it's actually been proven to be one of the best red meats. Emu's a little bit different. It's full of oil. Uh, the oil is actually really good for your heart and your liver and your blood, so it's important that we utilise that. It's good medicine. We hear the stories of... Um, my grandmother, rest in peace, who's placed at our cultural centre now, she would do these cooking techniques. As a child, I would be amazed because I'd never seen anything like it growing up. She would actually, we would actually catch the kangaroo and she'd want the intestines and the organs. And she'd sit by the river and she'd clean the intestine out slowly as she does. She'd chop up the liver, the kidney, some wild herbs, some bush spices, and she'd stuff it back into the kangaroo intestine and she would actually steam that on some volcanic basalt rock that was collected locally um, and using some hot coals, jarrah, she oak or banksia. And some of those old cooking techniques was amazing and now with the sort of work that we're doing on country, 
we really want to bring those old recipes and those old foods utilising all these ingredients. Here we have the picture of the borana, which we had in the tea, which is the red one in the middle. The tea is to the left. The she-oak on the far right is a small she-oak tree, the gully gully. Now that's a sacred Aboriginal woman's tree in our area. And when you burn it, it burns down to a white powdered ash. It's got many different uses. The she-oak pinnacles were used, the root systems were used, but the ash was really important because it was used for ceremony. So when the Aboriginal woman would have a baby, she would actually use the hot ash to stop the bleeding of the umbilical cord once it was cut and also use it for ceremony. So if we do take from this, from this specific plant, it's important that we respect the laws and customs behind these plants as well. Traditional dance, our dance group is the Wadani Dreaming Dancers and the dances that we do most of the time is about the hunt for the animal. So when you return back to the camp at night time traditionally, it wouldn't be just like, oh, I caught a kangaroo, love. Oh, here's an emu there, I caught some fish, yep. It would be more appreciated so they'd start to do the dance which would reenact the animal and tell the story. And through the, a lot of the songs and the stories and the dancing is how a lot of information and knowledge was passed through Aboriginal culture. This handsome young fella is my son. He's only six and he's already started to immerse himself within his own culture. And we're really seeing a real change in Australia with Aboriginal kids because they've been exposed to culture from a young age. As you know, it's no surprise and, and that Aboriginal people and culture had, go, had to go through lots of trials and tribulations to, to become where we are now. And for 50,000 years, the biggest thing that happened to Aboriginal people was colonisation, because right there and then the Aboriginal people had to learn to change and adapt to become more diverse in the movement of time. So that's why a lot of traditional groups, we still maintain our five sets of laws, customs, spirituality, beliefs and dreaming, but also being able to have a balance between the traditional and contemporary lifestyle. We created the community land care nursery. Because we're foraging our ingredients, we have a lot of seed. The seeds would go back into the nursery, which is a volunteer nursery. Three days a week, we'd have volunteers come in. We germinate the seeds, we sprout them, we plant them back on country where we're harvesting. And we, once again, we're creating a sustainable food source. The volunteers are mostly elderly but we also use the community nursery as an educational tool as well to create people more aware. If we're foraging for foods on country, it's important that we do it in a sustainable way, environmentally friendly and caring for country. At our cultural centre, we have huge areas, meeting areas, where we explain to guests the importance of caring for country. It's a sense of identity. So cultural awareness is really important because it just, it really implements the fact that Aboriginal people would care to the point where they would actually go out of their way to make sure that food and laws and customs were abide, and we do this by sharing and creating cultural awareness programs. Education. In our, in our group in the coastal area, we do a lot of educational programs with kids because from a young age, we want these kids to understand and have that connection back to the country. And not necessarily Aboriginal kids, non-Aboriginal kids as well. So it's really important that we continue and, uh, and share Aboriginal knowledge about the land so that these kids can grow up being more aware of the surroundings, of the plants, of the animals and of course the culture and the people. Every time you go to a sacred place, every time you eat traditional food, every time you interact, you immerse yourself within Aboriginal culture which makes it a part of who you are as an Australian. It's a part of our past and present. Here's a group from the Wadandi Leadership Program. Now, these kids were taken from the city, hadn't had the opportunity to be a part of the interesting opportunities, the interesting initiatives that we've created. So we take them down for three days. We go through a whole leadership program. First day is cultural, second day is recreational. Third day, these guys are getting involved, hands-on cooking, using the ingredients, uh, helping skin the kangaroo, helping make the dampers, helping light the fire. And then when they leave, we do a follow-up program to see how this has impacted and how this has influenced them in their life choices that they make from there on. We have three interesting characters here, all very passionate, all very determined people. The reason why I put this, this in the slide here is because we're sharing knowledge. <coughs> and uh, sharing knowledge, Aboriginal people have been some of the most patient people in the world. 
and sharing knowledge and information is really important and uh, we don't want to hold it back even though some Aboriginal culture has been exploited in the past it's important that we share and we create respect opportunities agreements relationships and continue on on, on our path Carla like I said Carla is fire and it's more than just fire it's life it's family it's kinship Caring for country is the most important and it also, for me, spiritually and culturally, it's important we maintain and look after our areas. So every winter we'd plant over 250,000 different types of bush medicine, bush tucker plants, native trees from the Landcare Nursery with the Aboriginal students and kids from the area back on the country in different locations. And that really does, I guess, feel, it feels better within yourself to be able to do that. Um, it's taken this time now to get to a point where we can actually start to give a lot back. And uh, this is what makes food sustainable. It makes our areas, um, I guess, it looks after the areas. We don't um, exploit the area. We revegetate, re rehabilitate rivers and waterways. In our area, there's a big problem with bushfires. Very hot during the summertime, even the slightest spark, bang, bushfire would burn thousands of hectares of native bushland, fruits and flowers, and also, more importantly, animals. I'm just going to share a little story <coughs> before I finish. And this story is from my old uncle. And it really does implement the fact of how Aboriginal people perceive their roles and responsibilities about caring for country and land and animals. Before, everything was physical, like me and you, everything was in spirit form. And all the spirits, they circled around the sky. But the earth, the Nullabuja, the red soil, the giver of life, was very cold, it was very dark, and there was no life. One day, seeds fell from the stars, and they landed in the Nullabuja, the red soil, the giver of life, followed by a downpour of rain and sunshine. And up come all the beautiful paperbark trees, all the she oak trees, and all the beautiful wildflower and bush tucker and bush medicine plants. And as all these big old tall trees stood there as they swayed in the breeze, they wondered. They said, who's going to look after us? Who's going to look after all the beautiful bush tucker and bush medicine plants? Who's going to look after all these generations of rainforests? The big old carry tree, he stood there as his leaves swayed in the breeze. He said, I can't be the carer. I can't be the custodian. Because my, my root systems are stuck in the ground. I can grow to a very old age, but I can only remain in one place. There's no possible way we could look after all the beautiful rainforests and bush medicine plants. Next to rise up out of the Nullabudja, the Mother Earth, the Red Saw, the Giver of Life, were all the animals. There was the Yonga, the Kangaroo, the Emu, the Waitch, the Kurta, the Goanna, and the Echidna, the Nyinyari. And over time, all these animals also turned to each other and they also wondered. They said, who's going to look after us? Who's going to look after all the beautiful generations of animals? Who's going to look after all the beautiful rainforests and bush medicine and bush tucker plants? Who is going to be the carer and the custodian for all these wonderful things? Well, the first animal to speak was the echidna, the ninyari. And he turned to the other animals and he said, I can't be the boss. I can't be the carer because these thorns on my back I might cause harm to others. And I can only defend myself. So he quickly scurried off in his direction with the ants along the river, gone. Next animal was the goanna the curder, and he crawled along on his legs and he stood up on his back legs and he turned to Yonga the kangaroo and Emu the witch. And he said, I can't be the carer either. He said, I've thought about it and there's no possible way because my belly is so low to the ground and I can only scavenge across the floor of this earth. But what I'll do is I'll look after all the dead things. Every now and then you'll see the carcass of an animal, you'll see the goanna come along and try to clean it up. Just like a shovel-nosed shark or a stingray in the ocean, the guy plays the same role and responsibility on the floor of the earth. Next animal was the emu, the witch, and he stood up and he said, look at my beautiful emu feathers. Look how fast I can run. And he ran up to all the other animals and said, pick me. I can look after all of us. Pick me. I can be the carer and the custodian. Pick me. I can look after us for future generations. And while the emu was running up to all the other animals, the yonga, the kangaroo, he stood in the distance and he shook his head. He said, look at that emu. Look at that witch. He is cartwara. He is crazy. It is not possibly understand we cannot be the carers of this earth. Me, Yonga the kangaroo, I can jump higher than anybody else. But fur covers most of my body, and I've only got these small kangaroo hands to care with. There's no possible way we could be the carers. 
the paperbark forests got together the she-oak forest and the carry forests and they made a big cocoon and they're born up out of the nullabudja, the mother earth, the red soil, the giver of life, first man and first woman. And in our area, they're known as Nyunga and Jundu. Jundu, she had beautiful long white hair that flowed down to the ground and Nyunga had locks that flowed up to the sky and they had large hands, the human being hands. Us human beings, future generations, ancestors that had passed Nyunga and Jundu at the time. And as time passed, all the animals turned to us human beings and they said, it's up to you humans. It's up to you humans to look after all the beautiful bush tucker and bush medicine plants. It's up to you humans to look after all the generations of animals. It's up to you human beings to be the carer and the custodians for all these wonderful things. And right there and then old Yonga the kangaroo, he made a pledge to Noongar and Jundu. He said, you can have my kangaroo fur for warmth in those cold winter nights. You can have my kangaroo meat for food when you get hungry. You can have my kangaroo bones for your spear tips and barbs. And yes, you can have my kangaroo spirit for future generations. And with that, the kangaroo took off along the river. The emu, he stood up on his back legs and he turned to Noongar and Jundal and he also made a pledge. He said, you can have my emu meat for food when you get hungry. You can have my emu feathers for your dancing costumes. You can have my emu oil for your arthritis and your sore joints. And yes, you can have my emu bones for your spear tips and barbs. But please don't use me until there's nothing left. And the last animal that was there was the curta, the goanna, because the echidna had already left. And he stood up and he turned to Yonga the kangaroo, emu the weich. And he said, I'm considered a delicacy to you people, so don't eat too much of me because I too have responsibilities. I have to look after all the dead things. So there it was decided, the human beings, us human beings, future generations, ancestors that have passed, would have to be the carer and the custodian for all these wonderful things to try and hand what we have here to the next generation in conditions that we received it, if not better. And remembering the land, the Nullabudja, the red soil, the giver of life was here before we came and will be here a long time after. I better wrap it up. Before I go, there's a little something I brought over from home and uh, that's for Rene so he can practice that fire lighting. Thank you very much. <laughs>